So our, our speaker today, uh, many of you know her, that's why you're here. <laughs> so there's not a lot I can really say about her other than a list of stuff about this long. So we're just going to shorten it. She's a life coach. Four books. Four books. Well, got news for you. <laughs> She's the founder and director of a nonprofit organization, the Center for Awakening. She's the author of five books. <laughs> so, in life, there are people, uh, communication is key. And there are people in our lives that are great communicators because they communicate from their heart and from their being and they in the true essence of who they are. And then there are people that are great communicators because they have great ways to express it with their words. Today, we're honored with a speaker that does it from both places. So let's please welcome Bonnie Elizabeth. Thank you, Mike, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you so much, Unity of Salt Lake City and Sandra Melbourne for inviting me here today. And thank you, all of you, my beloved friends and family, for coming here to hear me speak. I love and appreciate you all very much. And I'm going to speak today about the ecstatically transforming human being. And that is what I believe you all are, we all are, is ecstatically transforming human beings. So I'd like to start my talk with a story. And that story is about when I first came here to Salt Lake City. It was in 1994. My children, Asia, who just sang, she was four years old, and John, my son, was three. And I was the kind of mom, I was with my kids all the time before then, but I had to get a job. <laughs> and I didn't want to leave my children. I had this separation anxiety. I don't want to leave my kids, my babies. So I got a job at a preschool where I could be with them, make a little bit of money, not a lot, five dollars an hour. But I was happy because I didn't have to pay daycare costs. And working at a preschool was it was a great experience. I was kids, I just fell in love with so many of the children there. Adorable little children. There were challenging times working at a preschool. I have to admit, there was one little girl in the preschool I remember, and she sat in a corner all by herself, her head was down, her hair was in her face. And she wouldn't talk to anybody. You try to pull her out, but she wouldn't. She just yell at you, "Go away, go away!" I asked the teachers, "What's what's up with this little girl?" And they said that her parents were going through a divorce, and she was having a really hard time with this divorce. And I understood, so I, I went over and I I talked to her every day. I'd go over and say hi once or twice a day. Usually she'd yell at me and tell me to go away, and sometimes she even spit on me shoot me away. But I didn't stop. I'd go over every day and I'd say hi to her. At least, hello, how are you doing? And in the preschool, there was also these two brothers. They were like, they weren't the same age, but they were both very mischievous. They were a year apart. <laughs> oh, they would be teasing the girls, pulling the girls here. They'd break things, knock things over. And I would, just about the time I'd put one of the boys in, in time out, I'd turn my back and he'd just jump out out of the seat and he'd be out pulling some other girl's hair or doing something. I couldn't control him, totally unmanageable. I was not the best in controlling little children in the preschool teacher. Eventually, I knew that if I was gonna make a better life for my children and myself, I needed to get move on and, and get a job that was making a little more money so we could do maybe a few more things than just eat. <laughs> five dollars an hour. So I did. I, I left the preschool and I, I got another job and that was hard. It was hard for my children because they were kind of sad I left. They made it mean some things. So we talked about that. I moved on. I, I got a, a whole nother job and moved on in my life and I was able to afford to put my children through camp. 
So my son John, he would go to football camp and Asia would go to drama camp. And I made sure that they were always the opposite time. So when John was in camp, I could spend some alone time with Asia. And when Asia was in camp, I could spend some alone time with John. And I really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed their camps, and especially having, we call them dates. Let's go on a date, just the two of us. And at, the, at this particular year, uh, John was 10 and Asia was 11. And when I went to his camp, the, the ending ceremony for football camp was a football game. <laughs> and so I watched his, la his last football game of the camp, which was wonderful, and they gave awards. And so he became the MB MVP, most valuable player, of his football team in the camp that, that summer. I was very proud of him. And Asia was in drama camp. And I went to see her. And the finale of her camp was uh, a play. They would put on a play. They practiced it throughout the whole camp. And they put on a play. And this particular year, she was surprising, if you can see. She was going to sing a singing solo. So I was especially excited to come to her camp. So what I would do when my kids were little, and it, whether it was at school or whether it was at a performance, I would always get there really early to get a good seat. Because I wanted them to know I loved them. And also, I'm 5'2". <laughs> <laughs> and the chance of somebody sitting right in front of me that's taller than me like 90% chances of that. So I learned that if I want to really get a good view, I've got to get there early and get a good seat. So I got to the drama camp an hour ahead, whole hour ahead. I was thinking, I'll get a good seat if I go an hour ahead. I come in, it was up at the U, it was a beautiful auditorium. I walk in, and this beautiful, bright, charismatic, smiling little girl greets me and gives me a program. And I look out into the auditorium and whole front row is empty. So I went and sat in the very center front row seat. I knew nobody was going to be sitting in front of me. And I would have a perfect view of my daughter. I was so excited. I was very proud of my achievement. And I even took my coat off and put it on the back of my seat just to kind of mark my territory. <laughs> Nobody sits there. If I have to run to the bathroom, I still got my center front row seat. Well, then the little girl that had greeted me started walking towards me. And I got a little nervous. Oh, no, the front row is for the VIPs. They're going to move me. I'm going to have to move back. So I'm starting to feel a little protective of my, my good find here, my good seat. <laughs> and she walks right up to me and she says, Miss Bonnie? And I says, yeah, I'm Bonnie, and who are you? She was a little girl in the preschool that sat in the corner of the room with that dark cloud over her. I didn't recognize her. She was a completely transformed human being. I didn't even know her. I wouldn't even know it was her in a hundred years. Maybe you've known her in a hundred years. I was so inspired by that little girl. It impacted me so deeply to see how someone could come from such, such fear and such darkness to such a bright spirit. So I'd like to share another little story with you. Would you like to hear another story? Okay. This story, it, it's a little sad. So that's okay though, because it has, it has a good ending. And I'm gonna talk about another little girl that I know, and I want you to know that she has given me permission to tell you this story, so you don't have to worry about that. So this little story is about this other little girl, and she was four years old. It starts when she's four years old, and her family moved to a new town, a new, a new home. And it was, she was so excited, because this home was bigger than her last home. It had more rooms. She didn't get her own bedroom, but still had more rooms. And it was in a neighborhood where there was lots of houses and lots of little kids to play with. So she was really excited. So the very first day she got to this new house, 
She, she went out looking to play with somebody. I want to find a friend. And right across the street, sitting on the front steps of the house across the street was another little girl. So she ran over and introduced herself very confidently and started to play with this little girl. And Britt has given me permission to call this little girl Britt. And Jan has given me permission. So, the old, so this other little girl was four years older than the other little girl. And we're going to call her Britt. And Brett, and we're going to call the little girl from time to time. Mostly little girl, but we'll call her Jan once in a while. <laughs> Jan and Brett are good friends. So Jan went over to play with Britt. Britt was four years older. But they had a blast. They sang, and they danced, and they laughed their heads off. They had so much fun. They shared M&Ms, and they even had an M&M fight. They were throwing M&Ms at each other back and forth. They had such a good time. And the little girl didn't leave until her mom called her across the street to come in for dinner. They had so much fun. And the little girl, Jan, she grew up, and she became seven. And when she was seven, her parents went through a divorce. And it was hard for the little girl. But at the same time that her parents were going through a divorce, her mother was having a nervous breakdown. And that was really hard for the little girl. Because her mother became very different than she had remembered her whole life, the whole seven years. This little girl, her mother would, would wear different clothes. She would act different. She was completely different. She wasn't, she was half, sometimes she was home, sometimes she would be gone for a couple days. No one would even know where she was. Sometimes the mother would be very reckless. She drove recklessly. She totaled the family's car, broke some bones. But she continued to drive, and she drove with the little girl in the car with her at times, and the little girl was really scared because the mother would speed and, and pass other cars and windy, twisty roads going maybe 100 miles an hour and she was, the little girl was sure at times that she was going to die and we're going to get in another crash and she was going to die. Mm -hmm. So she started to kind of be a little scared of her mother, not really trust her mother, the person she trusted so much, the most in her life. And the mother had taken her to a class one time and she was supposed to pick her up at six and so six came and all the other little kids mothers came and picked them up but the little girl's mother hadn't shown up and then seven came around and the little mother girl's mother didn't show up and eight came around no mom nine wasn't until a little before midnight when that little girl's mother came to pick her up. And by that time, she was so afraid, she just she couldn't even talk. She just held it all inside. She didn't say a word to her mother. She was just afraid. And the mother did a lot of crazy things. One of the scariest things for the little girl was that the mother uh, poured gasoline all over her. Her mother would go from happy to angry to sad to very deeply depressed. And one time when she felt depressed, she felt suicidal. And she put gasoline on herself and lit a match to her body. Mm. And, and uh, she didn't die, but she had burned scars on her body. And when the little girl would see the scars, it scared her. It just scared her inside. She didn't really know what to think. Then eventually there was that fateful day when the ambulance came, it was late at night, the police came, the fire engine came, and the little girl could hear all kinds of commotion. There had been a lot of drama happening in the house over the months, a lot of arguing and screaming that she wasn't used to, but this was more than usual. She could hear the mother screaming, the police screaming, her sister downstairs crying a lot, and she was up in her bedroom. She tried to go downstairs, but she couldn't. She was told to go upstairs. So she could just hear it all, and, and she could see the flashing lights on her wall and her ceiling. And eventually, after maybe an hour of this, she heard her mother being dragged across the yard and, and the ambulance door shutting, and her mom was gone. What she didn't know is that the mother would be gone for almost two years. And during that two years, it was not an easy time for the little girl. Because there was 
not all, but there were some, but some caretakers that weren't very nice. And that was hard, and they were strangers. She didn't feel safe with those strangers. And the little girl also was struggling because at that same time, her sister was going through a really hard time. Her sister was older, and this sister had a lot of responsibility and a lot of burden. She saw a lot more than the little girl. And she had a lot more responsibility. And the older sister, the older sister had no support, no one to talk to, no counseling, nothing. She was going through a really hard time. And so the sister not having much support or anyone really to talk to ended up taking out a lot of her frustrations on the little girl. And so the little girl experienced some physical, emotional, and mental abuse from the older sister. She'd often lock her in a closet. She'd call her really mean names. She'd keep her from playing with her best friend, her one and only best friend. She'd forbid her. And the little girl felt really trapped and powerless. She, she would scratch her a lot. And the little girl, remember sitting in, it was either second or third grade, and this little girl sat in class and looked down at her hands, just looked at all the scars all over her hands, even up her arms, from the sister digging her nails into the little girl's hands. And she looked at the hand, her hand, her, her hands, her own hands, and she said, wow, doesn't anybody notice? She felt no one cared. No one cared about her. So during this time when she, her mom was hospitalized, she went to visit. Every couple weeks, this little girl and her siblings would go and visit the mother in the state institution. And it, was, it, was, it wasn't the, a day at the beach for the family. There were people that were knocking their heads on the tables. There were people in the corner screaming. She saw things. She saw people out of control where staff had to calm them down and give them a shot and wrap them in that white jacket. It smelled really bad in there. And her, mo her mother was always, you never knew how her mother was going to be. She would either be yelling at her and her siblings or not talking at all or, or, she, or not, not all kinds of random things. Her mother had lost all her hair from shock treatments. And so the little girl remembers one day in school when they had to tell what they did for their vacation. And the only thing she had done was gone to see her mom a couple times. Everyone's talking about going to, to Disneyland, Yellowstone National Park. And she's thinking in her mind, what can I say? So she didn't share anything. But she thought in her mind, it made her sad to think that all the other little kids are going to Disneyland and Yellowstone and where is she going on her break? To the mental institution to see her mom. She saw things in that institution that no seven-year-old child should ever see. She knew that. Even at seven, she knew that. But as time went on, the little girl grew. She became 10 years old, and she decided she was going to take guitar lessons. And it was very convenient that Britt across the street was a guitar teacher. So she went over across the street with her guitar to Britt's house. Now, she hadn't seen Britt, actually, or played with Britt since that very first day she had moved in. So Britt was kind of like a stranger now. She was 11, and Britt was... 15. So she's older and she's a stranger. She sat in Britt's bedroom with the guitar lesson and she didn't speak a word. She was too afraid. She was too shy. She was painfully shy. And even after the third lesson, she still didn't speak a word. She listened and she practiced. She did her best. But she was too afraid to talk. So after that third lesson, Britt looked at the little girl and said, it's okay to talk. It's okay. The other little girl
girls that come here that I can't shut them up. <laughs> They're doing back bends and cartwheels in my bedroom. It's okay to talk. So the guitar lesson went on. It was a wonderful guitar lesson. Uh, at the end of the lesson, she still didn't talk. She was still too afraid to talk. So Britt said to the little girl, are you alive? Is anybody home in there? And when the little girl left Britt's house, she walked across the street and she remembered being on those front steps of Britt's house when she was three years old and she was so alive, she was fearless, she was so happy. She was a little spitfire. What happened? She thought. What happened to myself? She thought. Now I'm 10, just a few years later. I can't even talk. I'm petrified of the world and life. What's wrong with me? But then she had another thought. And she thought in her mind, I'd like to get back to being that three-year-old little girl. I don't know how. I don't even know if it's possible. I don't know. Maybe I never will, but I'd like to get back to being as live and expressed and fearless as that three-year-old girl. She didn't know if it was possible, and she didn't know how. But she did have that thought in her mind as she walked home. And shortly after that, her mom had another nervous breakdown, and she actually, her mother took her guitar over to California and never was to be seen again. But life went on for this little girl, and she lived her life, and she continued on. She did the best that she could, She's kind of forgetting about that thought that she had, but she just went one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, moved on in life. And then there was this one day, this one auspicious day in the life of this little girl. And she was an adult now. And she was sitting in the very front row of an auditorium, in the very center seat of that auditorium. And an 11-year-old girl came up to her and showed her that she could get back to that three-year-old little girl, that it was possible. If that little girl that was 11 could do it, she knew she could do it too. She knew she could come back to life. She knew that she had come back to life that she had a long way to go still, that she had broken through a lot of shells, but she still had a lot of shells to break through. But that little girl gave her hope, gave me hope. That little girl gave me hope that I could return, that I could let the power within my soul, just like she did, shine through and I could come back to life that I could be fully self-expressed, I could be fearless again, that I could actually someday stand in front of a large group of people and speak. That 10-year-old girl that I was, the 11-year-old girl that I was, 10, 8, 9, never could have imagined herself standing in front of a group of people, ever. So human beings can, can transform. I know. I know from experience. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what you've been through in life, no matter the hardships, the challenges, no matter what you've done or what anyone else has done to you, there is a power inside of you that is so immense and so strong and so powerful that nothing in this physical world can keep that down, can keep that from shining through 
And sometimes those experiences can empower you to be even brighter and more powerful than you ever imagined. I'm grateful now for all the challenges in my childhood. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy having a mother with a mental illness or a sister who abused me. I felt very trapped, very powerless. And I didn't think I could get, ever get out from under that, that trapped feeling, that I would be trapped and powerless for my whole life. But I did. I don't know how I did it. I do, I do know that it started with self-love. It also, also allowing other people to contribute to me has been huge. Growing up, I was alone. I did everything alone. I spent all my time alone because that was where I was safe. If I wasn't out in the woods alone or in school, I was up in my room alone. My brother just came for Halloween. He said, I remember you were up in your bedroom every night all by yourself. That was all through high school, junior high. That's where I was for hours, all alone up in my bedroom by myself because I was safe. And I enjoyed being alone. But I didn't go out to parties in high school. As much time as I could be alone, the better. People were scary and threatening to me. They weren't safe. I was comfortable alone. But I've learned to let other people contribute to me, that other people are my friends, they are my allies. This world, this entire world is us. Everything inside and everything outside, it's all us. Let the love around you contribute. We're all walking one another home. Deep down inside, we are all the same. We're all one, we're all connected. We need each other. We go home together. And this world and this planet is transforming. The human beings on this world are transforming. We are becoming a new species. We are becoming a brand new, highly evolved, higher conscious species. All of us. Our brains are changing. You hear neuroplasticity? Well, I think of it as organic. Our minds, we are not like an a, a inanimate, inanimate object, even though they're alive too, but you take a piece of glass and you smash it into a thousand pieces. It's hard to get it to come back. But a human being is different. We can be, feel like we've been smashed into a thousand pieces. And a lot of us have. We all have our stories. We all have our pain. We all have them. And I've heard stories that are a lot worse than mine. And we can come back stronger and more powerful because the power inside of us is who we are. And that power is so immense, so vast. I'd like to conclude with a little meditation. You don't have to close your eyes, but I want you to just imagine for a moment the hydrogen bomb, the energy and the power in a hydrogen bomb. We've all seen them. The hydrogen bombs are bigger than the atom bombs. Just imagine that power, and that power for good, for love, for intelligence, for wisdom. An all loving, all good power as powerful as a hydrogen bomb. Just imagine that power. Imagine that power inside you. That power is inside you. Imagine it. And the sun, our sun, in one solar flare, has millions of hydrogen bombs. The energy is released of millions of hydrogen bombs. So just imagine that much power inside you. There's an average of 10 solar flares on the sun per day. That's just the surface of the sun. Imagine the power of our sun. Trillions and trillions of hydrogen bombs. That power inside of you. That is how much power is inside of you. And more inside of you. And they have found super suns. Super suns out in the universe. Super suns. And our sun, 
1.9 billion of our suns can fit in one super sun. 2.9 billion. That's a lot of power, a lot of power, a lot of energy, a lot of love, a lot of intelligence, a lot of wisdom, a lot of grace. A lot of transformation. That is how much power is inside of you. That is how much power is inside of you. A super sun, a super sun is inside of each and every one of us. Every human being has the power of a super sun. And more. I want you to know how powerful you are. Nothing. There's nothing you can't do. There's nothing that can hold you down or stop you or inhibit you or constrain you from being you. You are the most powerful beings. We all are. And we are transforming. This planet is transforming to an entirely different race, a different human race, an empowered race. It's all we are connecting. It's in connection now. All of science, they say before any organism goes extinct, it either goes extinct or that organism, all of that entire species has to go into a state of cooperation to save the species. Cooperation is the only thing that saves the species from going into extinction. So it's time the human race, all of us, as super sons, we all have our part, and no part is small. Cooperate together to raise ourselves up into this new level that's based on love and peace and harmony and wisdom and cooperation and profound love. And we can do it. We can do it. Together, we can do it. Only together. I love you all so much, and I thank you all so much for being here today. May you have a beautiful and blessed day. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.